I just quickly adjust it up a bit. Alrighty, good morning everybody. Steve. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, good morning. And uh, yeah, thanks for coming. Oh, do I need to go up there? Alright, right. tag me. Welcome online family and uh, family that joined us here at our location. Thank you for, uh, for making it. Um, yeah, we are excited to get back in the rhythm of things and see how things uh, continue to unfold in, these, uh, in this season. Um, so I'd like to open up in prayer and uh, yeah. Yeah, God, thank you for uh, this strange year that it is not uh, outside of your will, outside of uh, yeah, your goodness and your, your love for us. Um, yeah, I just, yeah, looking back, uh, to in January when we were praying for what this year would, would look like for us. Uh, one of the themes that kept coming up was a uh, year of 2020, a year of 2020 vision. Um, and a lot of times when we are looking to get 2020 vision on a certain uh, event in our life, it's always easier. We always get the, the better hindsight, um, better vision, better 2020 vision, looking back when things aren't as uh, yeah, emotional. You're out of the, the conflict and you can see things clearly. So, yeah, I, just, I think God is wanting us to use this time that we have um, to really look back with God on our lives and to see where we're at and where he wants us to go. And, uh, yeah, I think years down the, down the line, we're really going to look back in the season and see it as a, as a launching pad for us in the future. So... Yeah, I just pray that over all of us that we would use this season the way uh, God would uh, would see fit for us. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, announcements. Wednesday we have our encounters with Jesus, seven to eight thirty. Yeah, uh, in the fireside room, come join us. Seven to eight. My mistake. Yeah, seven to eight fireside room encounters with Jesus. Press into what God's doing in your life uh, and with your uh, church family. Um, we have a statement here today we're going to read, I'm going to read, and I'm 
Tithes and offerings can be placed in the offering basket with Usher's Daryl uh, in the back. Um, and also Monday through Friday, uh, the church offices will be open uh, 9 to 12. Um, yeah, we have an announcement about COVID-19 from the uh, Terrace Alliance Church Board, uh, and it goes like this. We strongly encourage the wearing of masks for the care and protection of your neighbor. Singing is considered a high-risk activity for the spread of COVID, so we strongly encourage you to wear a mask during worship to provide a safer environment for the people around you. Masks are available at the entrance or at the back of the sanctuary for your convenience. Thank you for caring for each other in this way. And uh, I'd like to call up Susan for this time. She is a chair of our, our board uh, for a statement to be read. Thank you. Just like to say that we're going, we're in the midst of reopening our office, our church office that has been closed since March, and there will be a bit of restructuring over the period, so it's going to look a little bit different. We will be speaking more about that next week. We'll be giving you more details. In the meantime, we're just asking that if anyone has office skills and. Uh, you might want to talk to God about what role you could possibly play in that. But there will be more details next week. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And at this time, we'd like to welcome our worship team up uh, to lead us into uh, yeah, the heart of God. Thank you. Amen. I just invite you to stand this morning. And we just want to position our hearts before him. And I'm just going to ask Karen just to, to release the sound of this beautiful grand that she does. And just bring us into the heart of the Father. Bring us into his presence. And we're going to be singing, Bless the Lord, O my soul. And the scripture says, And all that is within me, bless his holy name. We want to magnify his name together. So just align yourself with him right now. That when you're seeing this and your expression of it is out of the deepest, you're like you're out of your belly, out of the deepest place of your heart. Thank you, Jesus. We just bless you. We honor you, God. We exalt you right now to the highest place. Your name. 
this declaration from our lips. Thank you.
dear friends, won't you please just take your seat for a moment? What a beautiful day just to, in fact any day is a good day, but especially today as we just remember what the Lord has done. Remember that perfect, perfect sacrifice that He paid for every one of us. And, and it's a joy and it's a privilege just for us to, to take stock of what that actually means. And I'm going to read a portion of scripture which you all know so well. And I'm trusting we don't just read this once a month. I'm trusting we don't just partake of the Lord's, or remember the Lord's death and His burial and His resurrection once a month. I'm trusting it happens a lot more than that. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23 and verse 26, the scripture says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after saying, after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this drink, eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's a remembrance, isn't it? It's a remembrance of what Jesus did on the cross. It's a remembrance of the great love that he has for each one of us. It's a remembrance that we have the opportunity to stand blameless before God. I just say, wow, I can't understand that. I can't comprehend that. But it's a reality, it's a truth. And so this morning, to me, it's the greatest day of the month when we can actually just get together as a as a group of believers, group of friends, as a family. And we can just partake of, of the emblems. Remember what this is all about. Remember that there's a cross on the right hand side that is empty. My Jesus isn't in that cross. He was on that cross. But that cross is empty now. And so I encourage you that um, if you... We have got a couple of extra unused goblets in the front. And we've got some... Um, it's not quite wine. It's, a, it's not quite wine or grape juice. I'm not sure what it is. It's um, it's something, but it certainly signif- symbolizes the Lord's bread, the Lord's blood. Sorry, I'm listening to <laughs> to rejoicing happening around me. So, if you don't have and you would like to participate, please feel free to come forward. Um, yeah, that's, that's all good. Bren's got it next to him, and there's all the, gob- the goblets next to him as well. So, yeah, let's just take off the, off the bread. I'm going to wait one or two minutes, seconds maybe. This is something which I don't believe that we should rush. Scripture talks about tearing one for another. And it's a great opportunity just to remember this beautiful time together, corporately. So Lord, I just thank you for loving us so much. 
Father, thank you for sending your precious son, Jesus, to die for us. For me, Lord. For each single person that calls himself a child of God. What an honor. What a privilege, Lord. So, Father, I just thank you for your body that was broken for each and every one of us. Lord, it's not something you, you, you're forced to do. It's not something you, you had to do. It's something that you willingly did so that there can be relationship between God and man. Thank you, Jesus. So, Lord, this morning, we gladly partake of your body, Lord, remembering you, remembering not how much you loved us then, but how much you still love us, Lord. We gladly partake of your body. Thank you for the new covenant, Lord. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for what it signifies. Thank you for the power that is in your blood, Lord. Thank you for the life that you shed so that we can have life. We can have freedom. We can be restored, Father, in the way in which you intended us to be made. So, Father, I just... Thank you again for sending your precious son to shed his blood for every one of us, Lord. And we gladly partake this morning, Lord, of your blood. We do it as a celebration, Jesus, for what you've done. Thank you, Jesus. So, Father, I just pray even, even now, Lord, that you, because of the perfect work on the cross, Lord, I just pray that anyone who has an affliction, anyone who has a disease, anyone who's ill, anyone who needs prayer in any way, Lord, I pray that you just touch them supernaturally, whether it's in this place right now, whether it's someone who's one of the viewers that are just listening online, Lord. I just pray that you reach out, Holy Spirit, you're not separated by time and space. We just pray for supernatural things to be happening even now as we speak, Lord. Because of what you did for us 2,000 years ago on a cross, Lord. For the lives just to be lived in wholeness. For relationships to be restored. For people to walk in freedom, Lord. Thank you for your power, Lord. Thank you for your love, Lord. We worship you, we bless you, and we celebrate you, Lord. We celebrate your goodness. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Debbie, and the worship team. Just love that. Just love that last song as well. It really was beautiful. Good morning, dear friends. As I've said earlier on, good morning or good evening or wherever you might be all over the world or to our online guests, to our friends in Terrace. No matter where you are, welcome. It's, a good, it's good to be together. It's good just to be able to look into so many faces that are actually here. I can't see you guys on the other side of the, of the phone. I can't see whether you're smiling at me or drinking coffee or... I can't see it, but I can see these guys over here. But what I do know is that we are both connecting with Jesus in this moment. So that's, that's the joy that I, that I have. So, you're all very clever people, so I don't have any, any doubt whatsoever that what I'm going to be saying today, you would have heard not once, not twice, several times before. I'm going to be speaking a lot this morning about your ability to adapt when you're outside of your comfort zone. So, all of you bright people are saying, Steve, there's, there's two quick words for that. It's called your adaptability quotient. Simple as that. It's your ability to cope when you're outside of your comfort zone. And so I want to talk about why adaptability means so much now, even probably more so than, than before. The answer of COVID and the fact that it's probably here to stay for some time has resulted in technology changing dramatically. It's resulted in how we interact with each other. It's resulted in many changes in the way we do business, how we do sport, how we play, how we do church, how we gather for a church. It's, it's, it's required some major reshuffling that has had to take place. And our normal and our familiar behaviors that have taken us years to hone to get to a particular level of of acceptability and we take great pride in how we interact and how we relate and how we we do things many of those norms or those behaviors have come falling down those that haven't I believe that many many mindsets paradigms will no longer be effective they are no longer effective now and give us a couple of months and certainly in a couple of years, they will no longer be the norm. As a result, our adaptability quotient, or our AQ, will soon become the primary predictor of success. Our general, our general intelligence, we used to refer to that, we still do, is our IQ, and our emotional intelligence, our EQ, I believe will be taking a very distant backseat. I look at everyone sitting around here, I'm sure that you all remember that in the 1990s, maybe not all of you, some of you, will remember that emotional intelligence seemed to be the big buzzword, it was the big boom word. Psychologists argued that we've been over-indexing or over-indexing on, on IQ instead of prioritizing on the smart people and the ways of how I relate to things and how my personality is involved in, in, in what I'm doing in life. Of course, this trend was actually noticed in the church as well. We had many absolutely brilliant books. Some of you may remember The Spirit Controlled Temperament. And there's a whole lot of these other types of books, all illustrating one's ability to, to cope on an emotional plane, on an emotional level. And many folk focus on developing their personalities. The interesting thing is that I believe that EQ is important. IQ is important. But they are merely legs of a stool. Both EQ and IQ aren't fixed properties that can't be developed. They can be developed through dedication and hard work. But this morning, I want to mention something. I believe adaptability quotient is also something which can be developed. It can be something which can be worked on, which is going to be integral 
as we go into the next season. Some of us are born with more potential to adapt than others. We've all got those friends who, who might loathe changes, they don't want to do anything new, they don't want to do anything out of the box, and they're still our friends. And then we've got a couple of friends that they're quite happy to take on new challenges, new risks, new things. They're quite happy to step outside of their paradigm, outside of their, their mix, and to explore. This morning, I want to invite each one of you to take the plunge, to see what Jesus is doing, and I invite you to stretch your faith. I invite you this morning. Let's see what Jesus is doing. Let's see what the Holy Spirit, let's see where the Holy Spirit is leading us, and I invite you to jump in. The Lord has been speaking to this particular church, but not just to this church. I know that He's been speaking to His bride about Him doing a new thing. He's been speaking in particular to us about this explosion and this expansion. He's been speaking to us about the new wine and the new wineskin. And to press into that which is the new. Is it new from the Lord? No, it's not. But it's a new manner. It's something which is different every single day. We can't rely on that which was good for yesterday. What we had yesterday was great stuff. It was good stuff. But the Lord has got something new. And so I'm trusting this morning that our ability to adapt will be, will be heightened. Our ability to adapt, to adapt will influence our effectiveness in this society, in this community. That we will become more relevant and without doubt we will be able to produce more fruit for our God. So as a youngster, I remember being taught by my Sunday school teachers that Nehemiah was the shortest man in the Bible. It had to be. You've all heard that analogy or that story because he was only knee high Maya. <laughs> but they were wrong. So if my Sunday school teachers are listening, you guys taught me bad theology. Nehemiah actually was the guy who was the naughtiest guy in the world. He was always in trouble. He had to be because he was knee high in the mire. Oh. <laughs> Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther all come out of the same general context, the same period in Israel's history. <clears throat> For many reasons, they appear in reverse chronological order in the scripture. There's some great reasons for us to talk about that. It won't happen today, though. But all I'm saying is that Esther actually happened first. That's when God first began to move in the midst of Israel's captivity to return this nation to the promised land. In a nutshell, Esther, an instrument of God's grace, was sent to the throne of Persia, and so she was able to move the heart of her husband, who happened to be the king. That he allowed Nehemiah, the cupbearer, to return to Jerusalem. And Nehemiah began the work of rebuilding the walls and the gates of Jerusalem. The restoration of the house of God is always a priority on the way back to God. And the restoration of your life and getting things back in order, or maybe just getting them in order, begins by, allow, by you allowing God to bring that restoration in your life. Then comes the building of the walls and the building of the gates, as we will see in Nehemiah. And so I'm excited over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be speaking about a whole lot of aspects and I'll, I'll allude to exactly what we're going to be speaking about at the conclusion of my message. But a wall symbolizes many things. I think in today's day and age, we don't have the same context of walls. Um, we do to a certain degree, 
But in ancient times, a wall of a city symbolized strength and protection. Your defense was based on the size and the strength of your walls. And some of those walls were tremendously thick and high. The walls of Babylon, as recounts in the story of, of Daniel, were 380 feet thick and a, over 100 feet high. That's pretty massive. And so we've each got, every one of us, every family, have got different areas that they need walls to protect us from things against. And I ask the question now, what do walls signify in your life? And then I ask the question, what does it mean to rebuild walls in your life? Many people's lives are in turmoil. Paradigms, norms, models have been turned upside down. I'm not being critical, but if you have a look at alcohol and chemical abuse and health issues and mental health issues, relationships, authority, the laws of nature, you name it, many walls have been crumbling down, not just today and for some time now already, and are in urgent need, my dear friends, of repair. To many, the status quo has become the norm. The fact that many people have grown so accustomed to brokenness that this has become the norm. But I want to remind each and every one of us this morning, this is not the way that God intended us to live. This is not the way God desired for us to live in relationship. God's desire is for us not to walk in fear or in desperation or in total isolation. And he certainly doesn't want us to be without hope. Nehemiah is the account of the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem, which Jerusalem was a symbol of the city of God, a God's dwelling place and the center of life in the world. And so this morning, I want you to have a look at the building of walls as being something where God is building up something in your life, something in this community's life. In an individual's life, the building of the walls would be a picture of re-establishing the strength, the life and the purpose for which God built you and made you. And it's where God in grace reaches down and eagerly responds to those who wish to co-labor with Him to rebuild walls. This is the picture of the way the walls of any life of any local church, any community, and dare I say it, any nation, can actually be rebuilt into strength, power, and purpose again. That's quite a mouthful. If I had my, my choice, I would have allowed my intro to carry on for a couple of weeks, maybe even months. But for the sake of this discussion now, concern is the first step. In rebuilding the ruins. The first step in this process is mentioned in chapter 1 and in verse 4. And of course I'm talking about the book of Nehemiah. I encourage, I encourage you to, to continue reading the book of Nehemiah. Um, it's not a very lengthy book, it's a very exciting book. And I will, I will promise you one thing, if you read the book of Nehemiah today, and you read the whole book, 13 chapters, and you have to read it again on Wednesday, I will guarantee that you will get something out of it every single time. Something different every single time. The first step begins with concern about the ruins. So Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 4, When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. My dear friends, you will never ever begin to rebuild broken walls and you, until you become concerned about the ruins. You will never be able to change the, the status quo of your situation until you are truly authentic, until you are real. 
We've been speaking over the past couple of weeks, months, that you can only be authentic and you're going to, you'll only be effective when you are truly authentic. And this is when true transformation will actually begin to take place. There seems to be so much instability around us. And many discussions that I have with folk, and as I listen to just general conversations, I tend to pick up on a central theme. And the theme is, is this as good as it gets? Is this it? There seems to be an insatiable desire in many sectors for people that are, are striving to attain the, the holy grail, as it were, the meaning of life. Trying to find enjoyment, trying to find satisfaction. I'm gobsmacked at the attempts that people make and what they do in order to, to try and find joy in life. And I'm not being a prophet of doom and gloom. But you know what I've come to understand? That in yourself, you will never attain that happiness. You will never attain that joy. You will never attain that comfort and that peace. You will attain a certain season of it. You will enjoy it for a short while. But that will soon come to an end. Those things that we try and build in our lives are not realistic walls. They won't bolster you against attacks. When Nehemiah hears this report about Jerusalem, and, and those of you that, that have read will know what I mean just in a, in a nutshell, a couple of his mates come to him and they give him a report of what's happened to Jerusalem as a remnant of these guys that are still in Jerusalem and how they are just absolutely broken. The whole city is lying in wreck and ruin. The gates have been burnt. The walls have come tumbling down. And he weeps and he mourns and prays for days, showing his intense concern, his sorrow, his sadness for what had happened to his beloved city. You'll never rebuild the walls of your life until you first weep over the situation that has developed. I can only imagine how Nehemiah must have sat down and assessed what had actually happened, what it signified, what it represented in Jerusalem when he saw, when he had heard the report. When he considered what had been lost, when he realized the depravity into which his beloved city had fallen. I put no doubt that his sorrow must have contained thoughts of the vast, the vast loss of godly potential and lives that now lay in rack and ruin. And he must have thought it had taken years and years to establish this, to build this up. And something had happened. I don't believe that it happened overnight. I believe it was a system of just gradually going Downhill, rapidly. Many of us, and I, and, I, and I really mean many of us, and I'm not being in any way critical, have looked at areas in our lives and we've said, this is what God intended. This is what God had, this isn't what God had in store. And why am I kind of floundering? Why am I kind of just launching into the plans and purposes God has got for me. And I asked the question this morning, have you looked at the possibilities that God has given you? Like Nehemiah, you may have received a word, you may have seen desolation, you may have seen ruin, you may have had areas in your life where a wall, part of the wall was broken. And maybe you said, I'm going to fix it up in due course. I'm going to get to that. Or... It's important, it doesn't look so nice, but it's okay, I'll get to it one day. And then you have another storm and a little bit more of the wall kind of collapses. Maybe you once experienced joy and peace and 
protection. But somehow you, could, you honestly don't feel that you can experience those things anymore. You kind of feel that it's the slightest little wind and you're shaken. Nehemiah's intense concern is immediately followed by confession. In chapter 1, you will read an account of Nehemiah's absolutely amazing prayer as he confesses that the nation had forsaken God and acknowledges the justice of God dealing with the nation. He recognizes He recognizes not only that he has sinned, but that his fathers have sinned. That they have broken the commandments that the Lord had raised up and the, stat the statutes and the laws of God. But he reminds God in his earnestness of the promises and the conditions that God had made to Israel. And he confesses and he repents. In his next step, which I love, his confession and repentance is immediately followed by commitment. Chapter 1 and verse 11, he says, O Lord, let thy ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servants and to the prayer of the servants who delight to fear thy name and give success to thy servant today. To do what? To do what? In the same prayer where he's, he's asking God for repentance, or where he's repenting and asking God for forgiveness, in the same prayer he asks God for favor. This man has got a plan formulating it in his mind. Even while he's been in prayer, he's, he's got a seed that is growing in his heart and his mind to rebuild those walls again. Here's something definite to ask. And he says, in verse, verse 11, Nehemiah says, Grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Here is a man who out of concern and after confession of his heart, he commits himself to a project, to a plan, to a work. And so he asked God to begin moving in the king's heart. I love this. This is an absolutely wonderful practical <coughs> blueprint of allowing yourself to be used by God in building his kingdom. To re-establish walls in your life, in your community's life, in your church's life, in the sphere of influence where God has placed you. In a nutshell, we get concerned about the status quo and recognize that we are responsible. We confess and repent. And we commit ourselves to action and ask God to act on our behalf. Because my dear friends, invariably and inevitably, we are not able to do the work at hand by ourselves. In fact, can I make this comment? We cannot do it by ourselves. God must move in areas where Nehemiah has got no control. He must move in areas where even if Nehemiah has got a certain amount of control, he needs God's intervention. Nehemiah prays about going to the king. And when he appears before the king, you know the story I'm trusting, the king notes the sadness on Nehemiah's face and says, You've got a little bit of a donkey face this morning, dude. What's wrong with you? And remember, the custom of this is that when you're in the king's presence and you put on a not such a cherry countenance, not such a happy countenance, that is enough reason to have your head chopped off. Simple as that. When you're in the presence of the king, you had to put on your best face. <laughs> so yes, this man, clearly not able to play the political game. Here is a man, and the king knows him well enough. The king knows Nehemiah because Nehemiah happens to be the cupbearer. And as you know, the cupbearer is the guy who tastes the, the, the king's wine to see whether he's been poisoned. It's a great job. <laughs> it's a great job when there's no poison in the wine, I guess. 
But the king knows that Nehemiah obviously loves the king and trusts the king. He's not on a suicide mission. And so when he sees Nehemiah's face and he sees how downcast he is, he says, what's wrong, bud? I want you to remember that the king's wife is Queen Esther. You could sit down with me and we could argue about it. I've, re- I've, I've done a lot of research and I am still willing to say that I could be wrong. Okay? But the commentaries that I've read, the research that I've done seems to indicate that this is the same Queen Esther that we heard about. And she's married to the man that Nehemiah, to the king that Nehemiah is asking for help. So this king already has a great knowledge and a great concern for the Jewish people. He's married to a Jewess. He clearly knows the plot they've been in. And so the king is incredibly positive and he responds favorably to Nehemiah's requests. The next necessary step in the program of reconstruction is courage. In verse 9 of chapter 2, we read this. Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen. But when Sembalat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the servant, the Ammonite, we'll just pause for a moment. When you recognize these names, and whenever you read of Ammonites and Amorites and Amalekites and Hittites and Jebusites and Perizzites and Parasites and Mosquito Bites, you know that you've got a problem. You're dealing with people that are opposed to against you, against the word that God is wanting to do. Satanic oppression and resistance inevitably resists the work, the will, and the ways of God. But when Sembalat the Horonites and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonites, heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. And so I made the comment earlier on, the next step is that you immediately need courage. I find that interesting. If you go back over the past couple of months, one of the verses that keeps coming out time and time and time again, if you have a listen, if you go and read up on the the prophetic words that we've got, you're going to get a constant thread of what? Have courage. Be bold, be strong, do not fear. Whenever a man like Nehemiah says, or a person like Nehemiah says, I will arise and build, Satan without doubt says, then I will arise and I will oppose. Satan makes things difficult when we start turning back to God, when we start rebuilding walls that need to be rebuilt, and we start to establish gates that have been burnt down. But I want to encourage each one of us to proceed with caution and thoughtfulness. When Nehemiah comes into Jerusalem and rides around the city at night, he doesn't just come blasé, guns firing, both hands blazing, and start rebuilding and putting bricks on top of each other or however they built in Jerusalem. He doesn't rush out and get all the people excited to start getting back to work. If he does, and if he did, he would have fallen straight into the trap of his enemies. The first thing that he does, he gets up at night when no one else knows, and he takes a little recce, he does a little reconnaissance of the area. He makes an honest survey of the facts. He takes a hard look, not at what he wants to see, he doesn't see the end product, he takes a hard honest look at the work that is required, at the damage that has actually taken place. 
He has a look at what needs to be rebuilt. He has a look at, is it necessary to rebuild foundations in certain areas? Before they can even start doing the nice frilly parts. Then he begins to carefully lay his plans. He, he devises a strategy that will be effective, not just for the next short while, but a long-term solution. So I just want to recap that last little section. Three principles of reconstruction are basic to rebuilding. A genuine hard attitude of concern, confession and commitment, and caution with courage, or courage with caution, however you want to put it. If the walls of your life are broken down, my dear friends, and if, and if your defenses have crumbled so that the enemy is attacking you on every hand, then you're starting to find that you're falling prey to any and every single temptation, I suggest you pay special heed to the process of reconstruction as set out in the book of Nehemiah. And as I speak to whoever happens to be listening, I say that is what I'm doing in my life as well. It is not, this is not Steve preaching to you. This is us on a journey together. But I invite you to join us. I invite you, let's, let's take an honest, transparent look at what is required. I want walls that are around me that can protect me. I want walls that are around me that will protect you. I want walls that, to me, it's a waste of time having a wall that is so low that anything, even a little mangy old dog can jump over and get me. I want walls that will keep out anything. Even big grizzly bears that come and visit you, Daryl, when you're sitting in your hot tub. Those are the sort of walls I want to run me. For the process of reconstruction to be successful, we learn first of all that the people were willing to work. Not some, not the select few, not the leadership team, not just leaders, but every single person needs to be on board. Secondly, every person became involved and immediately started doing something. Nehemiah, in the wisdom that God gave him, set about <coughs> allocating individual tasks to every single person. And he encouraged people, and we'll, we'll, we'll be speaking about that very soon. But he encouraged people to start having a look at the area outside their specific house. Areas in their specific lives. And they were personally involved in that work. And so as I've already mentioned, when you start to rebuild the strength of your life, you'll find that a force immediately arises itself inside you. You will find that there's an excitement, there's a joy, there's, a, there's an eager anticipation. There's, there's a hope. That's true. And I don't mean to burst any bubble, but I certainly really want to, to tell you the whole story. There's going to be another force that's going to try and dissuade you, to try and discourage you, to try and say you're wasting your time. That this won't work. This wall and these walls have been in rack and ruin. And they've been broken down for so many years. It just won't work. There's going to be a force that's going to try and resist the work that God is doing. So I'm trusting that God in His amazing ability and His amazing grace will strengthen each one of us today to make the required changes in our lives. I'm trusting that our adaptability quotient, which I was mentioning earlier on, will be developed as we start rebuilding walls and start re-establishing gates. 
there was a, a conference during the week. I didn't have the opportunity to listen to it. I, I didn't know about it. But something crossed my desk. It was um, 25 quotes of, of some of the speakers that, that, that spoke during this week. And I happened to, to really enjoy one of the speakers, one of the, the keynote speaker. This is a gent that you all, I'm sure, know, T.D. Jakes. And he made, this is one of the comments. You cannot be what you cannot see. You cannot change what you do not touch. You cannot heal what you won't lay a hand on. Can I repeat that? You cannot be what you cannot see. You cannot change what you do not touch. You cannot heal what you won't lay a hand on. That statement grabbed me by the throat. Because there's such truth in that. There's such reality in that. And my response to that particular statement, and I understand, I don't understand the context of this whole preach, but just simply that statement touched me in a huge way. And my response is that may God open our spiritual eyes to see. May God open our spiritual ears to hear. May God open my spiritual mind and my spiritual, my heart. May He give me an understanding to see the situation that I happen to find myself in. And when I say me, I'm speaking for us. And I'm praying that God has the same, God grants you the same revelation. This morning, the theme of our prayer meeting was revelation. May God give us a revelation. May God give us an understanding. Surely use the words which I just absolutely love. Lord, break our hearts for that which breaks yours. Lord, those things that you want to build in this place, Lord, I want to build those things. Lord, those things that you want to break down and tear down, I also want to do that, Lord. And those foundations, Lord, that you've established, I want to be involved in that as well. And I, and I say that of me, but two minutes ago, maybe five. I said it's not just about me, it's not just about the leadership, it's about us. And so my challenge goes out for us to start building, for us to start growing. The way that I've, I've designed this series, I've got little commas, and where there's a comma is a good time to stop. So maybe now's a good time to stop. Next week, we'll be looking at what was being rebuilt, what gates were going to be built, and how these gates apply to us today. Over the next course, over the next while, I would like to take a look at some of the strategies that Nehemiah used. And I'd also like to inform us, to allude us to some of the strategies that the enemy tried to use to discourage Nehemiah. What Nehemiah's response was to those. And every week, and you can remind me if I don't do it, I want to read one scripture, starting today. Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 15. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month Elul, in 52 days. The wall was finished in 52 days. Well, to me what's more important is that the wall was finished. The fact that it was finished in 52 days, that's amazing. That's just another issue. But the wall was finished. The wall was, complete, was completed. So my precious dear friends, I say may God bless you. May God keep you. May God strengthen you during the course of of this week. May God encourage you. May He allow that ability for us to change, to adapt, to make, make changes where required. Amen. Awesome. Thank you, Pastor Steve. Appreciate that word. That's so good. Yeah. So as we uh, as we look to um, to.
to leave here and continue the rest of our Sunday and to step out uh, with our families and friends and uh, yeah, to start our, our week new tomorrow. Um, yeah, I just want to encourage us with this scripture here uh, as we look um, with God into the walls of our life. Um, yeah, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and 10. But he answered me, my grace is always more than enough for you, and my power finds it full, or finds its full expression through your weakness. So I will celebrate my weaknesses, for when I am weak, I sense more deeply the mighty power of Christ living in me. So I am not defeated by my weakness, but delighted. For when I feel my weakness, I endure with treatment. When I'm surrounded with troubles on every side and face persecution because of the love for Christ, I am made yet stronger, for my weakness becomes a portal to God's power. So God, thank you that when, we, when you bring up these shortcomings in our life, it is not something that you want to put our head down and shame us, but it is something that we get to rejoice for, Lord, that, that your power is sufficient, that you're so excited and waiting for us to... Uh, to lay down our weaknesses to you, Lord, that you just want to yeah, empower us uh, and give us your goodness in those areas. So thank you, God. Uh, yeah, thank you, guys. If, uh, if anyone needs any prayer uh, during these times, we'll have our uh, ministry team up here. Uh, if you need any prayer or want any prayer on this topic of uh, yeah, what God wants to do with you uh, and what walls uh, he wants to rebuild in your life, if you want help. Uh, in prayer during this time. Uh, but other than that, thank you guys for coming, and we will see you Wednesday or Sunday. Cool. Thank you guys. Thanks, uh